Hey guys and gals, Nary here from Drake Queen Gaming. It's something to be on Twitter, The Gaming Dragon. As you can see, I'm coming at you with a new Let's Play series, Polar Night, which I can only describe from reading the description that this is possibly the furry version of At the Mountains of Madness. <laughs> and, of course, me being me, a, a lover of m almost all things Lovecraftian, I had to give this a go. Actually, the, the title screen kind of reminds me of that old uh, third-person shooter, Cold Fear, if any of y'all remember that. Anyway, y'all, let's jump right into this. I'm very, very curious as to where this goes. It's got great art assets, great music. Um, yeah, I, I can't wait. Anyway, y'all, right, let's let the cold horror seep in. The wolf couldn't see anything through the blizzard. Beyond the windshield was just a thick flurry, flick fl f a thick flurry of white. But then he didn't have a destination in mind anyway, just away from there. He had one hand pressed tightly to his abdomen, trying to compress the wound there. The other gripped the steering wheel tightly. A mix of adrenaline and the extreme cold disguised the pain. He was surprised he even managed to get the snow truck running and driving away from that madness. His eyes glanced at the glove compartment. Maybe he could just throw it out into the snow and drive away from this. Ooh. Seriously, after all that, you're going to fuck everyone over to save your own skin? The wolf ignored him, his companion sitting in the passenger seat. Engaging was pointless. His ears pinned back and fangs bared, partly from anger, but mostly from the pain in his belly. And yet shame bubbled within him. How could he think of breaking his promise? I'm not surprised, to be fair. It's all you ever do. Again, the wolf didn't respond. A flash of agony shot through him, reminding him of his grave wound. He grimaced and cried out, but his cry was followed by an awful spluttering sound. The sputtering continued until the engine fell silent, the vibration of the truck ceasing. The wolf sat there, staring at the dashboard in a mix of bewilderment and accusation, as if he could shame the machine into starting up again. He glanced at the fuel gauge. Empty. How? How could he have overlooked it? His departure had been hurried, to say the least. They not had the luxury for properly preparing. After an awkward pause, the wolf threw a frustrated tantrum, cursing and slamming his fist against the wheel, kicking the footwell and screaming. This isn't helping, you know. The wolf only barely resisted a furious snarl at the other figure, reining in his anger in order to slump forward, head against the wheel and eyes closed. Tears rolled down his muzzle. The journey had lasted maybe ten minutes at most. He couldn't have traveled more than a couple kilometers. All that effort and sacrifice just to fail within walking distance. There's a first aid kit in the back. Look like you need it. The voice snapped him back out of his misery. His eyes flicked open, now aware of just how tired he was. How the steering wheel of this utilitarian truck might as well have been the fluffiest pillow ever. As his awareness flowed back, the strength of iron in the cabin made him gag. He knew the source. He brought his trembling hand up to his face. Though the redness was hard to make out against the black fabric of his glove, the soaked glistening told him that it was saturated with his blood. Everything felt distant, like he was drunk. And God, did he know what drunkenness felt like. I'll lower this music a little bit. Oh, uh, lower the music. There we go. Okay. He reached into the glove box, his trembling hand brushing that cursed thing to grasp the flares he'd been given. Regardless of anything else, he needed to warn them, to tell them he'd failed. Maybe... Maybe they'd come for him. The wolf reached his trembling, blood-soaked hand to the door and, after a brief pause, opened it. He stumbled out of the cabin, not bothering to close it after him. Something told him there was no point. Bracing himself against the side, he staggered through the knee-high snow, still keeping pressure on his wound, though it now was more of a token act. He couldn't see more than a foot or so in any direction. Instead, he placed a hand against the truck's side, using it to guide him to the back. Upon reaching the rear doors, he had to pause for a moment, the howl of the blizzard saturated his mind, drowning out his thoughts. He brought the flare up, preparing to activate it. And then, just like that, his weak, trembling hands let it slip from his grasp. The buffeting wind and snow instantly carried it out of his field of vision. Fuck! No! He dropped to his knees, glancing around frantically as he dug out the snow for the flare. Without it, others would have no way of knowing he needed to, he needed to be guided back. Oh, one second, y'all. There we go. Okay. He clawed desperately at the thick snow, feeling his ability to move wane as the cold cut through his jacket, jacket and trousers and sucked the warmth from his already weakened body. Gazing at the snow... Uh, sorry, y'all. Alright, finish the rest of my OJ. Mm. 
Oh, man. Hmm. Gazing at the snow, illuminated by the rear headlights of the truck, he slowed and stopped, breathing heavily as his blood-soaked hands carved red swaths in the snow. He stared at the crimson streaks, realizing he was never going to find the flare. No! He threw his head back and let loose a primal, feral, lupine howl of rage and despair into the unceasing blizzard. He stared into the inky blackness, only slightly penetrated by the taillights. It didn't stretch more than a few meters into the blizzard. He could probably try to return the way he came, but... He couldn't have made the journey back, even if he wanted to. He turned, half crawling back toward the rear doors of the truck and the only shelter around. The cold barely registered anymore. He felt like his legs were moving on automatic. He pawed clumsily for the door handles. He missed them several times, his vision feeling oddly blurred. Was it the cold? Snow buffeting his face? Finally, his hands reached the handles and gripped them, yanking them open. The cargo compartment was almost entirely empty. They don't had time to stock it. He turned his gaze back where he'd come from. He scanned for the glowing crimson of the, of the return flare, but there was nothing. It agreed to wait for two hours before popping flares to guide him back. Far too long. Far too late. With Herculean effort, he hauled himself up out of the snow, dragging his body inside the cargo compartment. He turned, reaching for the doors once again and pulling them shut. Just like that, the blizzard dropped from an ear-shattering howl to a dull roar. As the wolf regained his bearings, the, the pain in his belly made him cry out, bringing tears to his eyes. He scanned the interior, looking for a first aid kit and saw it on the sidewall. His stomach lurched as he felt the wetness of his own blood soaking his entire abdomen. He reached a trembling hand for it, his fingers brushing the surface of the plastic container. But then his legs faltered and he stumbled, his hand grasping for purchase. The kit tore off the wall as he toppled forward onto the crates of the floor. The impact knocked any remaining breath out of him and he left him, left him paralyzed. His pained cry came out as a strangled gargle. The kit crashed to the floor, spilling its contents everywhere. He lay on his belly, one hand stretched out desperately for the roll of bandages, but he no longer had the strength to move. No, God, please, I don't want to die. Mom, I... Images of Mum came flooding into his mind, filling him with a yearning and an ache more intense than any rant than any wound. He'd have given anything just to see her, to hug her, to tell her. Connor, I need to hear you say the words. The figure spoke up behind him. He couldn't see him, but he could hear the bitterness, the mocking tone. I need to hear you say it, Connor. What you should have said to me and Mum before you abandoned us. Connor finally sagged. His limbs were numb and his vision was fading. Connor, say it. His vision went dark, closing in. The little strength he had left abandoned him as he, as he receded, his consciousness a flickering light in the encroaching dark. I'm... So sorry. Garrett... Oh my. Well, this, uh, this is already setting, uh, quite the, quite the tone for the rest of the game. <laughs> Clutching the three packs of cigarettes, I ambled over to the counter while the bored-looking bull cashier watched me. Aren't they all Duville? I gave him a blank look. I didn't speak Norwegian. He rolled his eyes, likely dealing with non-speakers on a frequent basis. Will that be all? He enunciated you clearly like I was deaf. Stifling the urge to tell him to stick his attitude, I gave him a nod. He told me the cost. My ear twitched. Much cheaper than Britain. Much cheaper than Britain. I was tempted to grab another couple packs, and also maybe to fuck with him a bit, but decided against it. I didn't want to take the piss. Or have him kick me out. Smokeless. I pulled a wad of Norwegian kroner out of my pocket. I flew through them before separating out a few crisp notes and placing them before the cashier. Cheers, pal. I gave him a brief smile and nod, but he didn't return it. Simply handed me my change. I slipped them into my pocket before turning awkwardly, my large backpack making it hard to maneuver through the slightly cramped store. I turned carefully to avoid sweeping the tightly packed shelves and marched to the door. I pulled my pack open. I pulled my pack of smokes open from my pocket, fumbling for my lighter in the other pocket. Oh, gorgeous art! My prized possession. Even before I started smoking, this is the only thing I have of my granddad. An Alisorn Sports Elite. Using my lips, I pull a smoke from the pack, 
stuffing it back in my pocket as I bring up my lighter, shielding it using my other hand from the frigid wind. Immediately it caught. The tip of my smoke started to glow and I inhaled. The welcome, calming rush of nicotine flooded into me. After a full breath, I flicked the lighter closed, tilted my head back, and after a moment, exhaled. The smoke mixed with the sub-zero wind and turned into a billowing cloud, hot breaths and fumes mixing with frigid air. This music kind of reminds me... Kind of reminds me a bit of, uh... Uh, Homeworld. When the, uh, I think it's the, those Tushan Raiders or whatever they're called, are first encountered. Yeah, this is what the music kind of reminds me of. At this time of year, long... Long year being... Long year being... Long year being... Could be pretty much summarized as a dark, as dark and cold. As my boots crunch the snow, I realize that for all we Scots like to whinge about our weather, this place was truly something else. Hmm. Oh, is the accent coming back, y'all? I think the accent is coming back! And yet I had to admit, Solon Cashier notwithstanding, I liked it. I liked the cold, the snow, the quiet. Only a couple thousand people lived here, and yet it didn't come across as a ghost town. Just peaceful. Not like Glasgow. I was fond of my hometown, but it could also be a madhouse at all times of the day. It was the only place I knew that I hadn't... Ha! Huh. I knew that I had the McDonald's. They needed bouncers because the nutters who came but how did night of McDonald's look okay. I shoved my hands in my pocket and kept the smoke set between my lips, drawing on it occasionally. The meeting spot was just up the road, maybe a ten minute walk. For all the thick warm gear, I was still feeling the chill. Long year being the largest settlement in Svalbard, a Norwegian archipelago near the, Atl near the Arctic, the northernmost settlement on Earth. It's also... Uh, there's also a creepypasta that says something awoke off the coast of Svalbard. So that is where I know this from. Another Lovecraftian thing. The other side of the road, walking farther into town were a pair of men who had rifles slung about their shoulders. A pretty crazy feature of Svalbard is that its residents are required to have firearms if they leave the settlement to the wilderness for protection from polar bears. Although they can't carry loaded firearms within the settlement itself, it was, still odd, it was still odd to me to see guns being carried in the open. They glanced over at me and, averted, and I inverted my gaze. I heard mumbling followed by a harsh laugh. I probably looked like a tourist or something. I tugged my dark fringe down a little. Fortunately, my left eye was, the, was, was on the opposite side of them. By the time I arrived outside the cafe, my smoke was almost finished. I glanced inside the window, trying to see if anyone was there. It was deserted. Apart from a solitary figure, a possum guy sitting at a table with a cup in front of him. He seemed to be absorbed in a book. No idea if he was a local or not, but given this is where we were supposed to meet, I figured it was a, g I figured it was a good bet he was here for the same reason I was. I guess it was as good as just one guy. As just the one, it was just the one guy. If I'd stumble upon a whole group, I might have lost my nerve. At so many new faces. With a few final, with a final draw on my smoke, I, st I stuck, I stubbed it out on a bend and pushed the door open. The coziness of the place hit me immediately, like I had just slipped into a warm bath. Despite the later hour, the place was the place still looked open. Chairs were neatly set against clean tables. A single staff member was behind the counter, bustling away. Apart from the generic background music these places tended to play, it was totally, totally quiet.
What were you reading? Oh, this? He reached behind- he reached beside him and pulled the book out, which, now I could see it properly, was a very battered paperback. It's Distant Origins by Rupert Gadala. Ever, ever- ever heard of it? I shook my head. Glad he was up for feeling the absence- feeling the silence. It's about how the Mosaic period was the work of extraterrestrials. Oh, goodness. Oh, goodness. We're doing some of this Chariots of the God shit, huh? <laughs> so you know how- So you know how during the Mosaic period a bunch of different species all gained sentience around the same time? Well, he didn't even give me time to answer. So my jaw just hung slightly open while I tried to maintain eye contact and nod. I guess he's enthusiastic. Gadella thinks it can only be it can only be because of, out, of an outside influence. Think about it. How else would so many different species all start to gain sapience around the same time? All right, I'm gonna go ahead and pause it right there. I'm really loving this so far. This is great characters. This is great art. Um. Oh man, I love the horror thing. I've been doing a lot of horror games lately. I hope you guys don't mind. Um. But yeah, y'all. Thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and that notification bell. Leave a super thanks for a tip if you can. It always helps. Until the next video, I love you all. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.